Moses. But verse 7, we see that Moses put the coat on him, Aaron, and tied the sash around his waist, clothed him with the robe, put the ephod on him, and tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod around him, binding it to him with the band. And he placed the breastpiece on him, and in the breastpiece he put the orim and the thumim. And he set the turban on his head, and on the turban in front, he set the golden plate, the holy crown, as the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, this stuff is described in Exodus, Exodus 28, Exodus 29, again, with the high priestly garments and, and the garments for the other priests as well. But I just wanted to say a few things about some of these things, especially the Urim and the Thummim, because that I, I get questions about this all the time. And it's kind of, it's kind of an interesting topic uh, because it, it deals with divination and whatnot. But the ephod, I think, is... is the ephod, the urim, and the thumim are the most interesting uh, objects here. So the, the high priest has to wear a, a linen tunic, and that gets tied with a sash, and then the, and he has to put a robe on top of that. And then the ephod was worn over all that. And the robe uh, that the ephod fits over, according to Exodus 28, was made of purple wool, and it had golden bells attached to it. Between each bell, there was a pomegranate. That's Exodus 28, 34, and Exodus 39, 26. And I... I think that's interesting because there's this, you don't actually see this in the Old Testament, but there there are uh, Second Temple sources and rabbinic, I guess, well, rabbinic sources. I, I wanted to say rabbinic speculations about why the bells were there and what purpose they served. And I, and I think there there is a practical possibility here. Let's just call it a possibility because you don't actually have any, an example of this historically, either in the Old Testament or not. But you'll actually read of, of speculations like when the high priest especially at the Day of Atonement, when he actually went in and stood before the Ark of the Covenant. He entered the most holy place. Since he's the one wearing the bells here, this this robe that has the bells, you know, sewn at the bottom, that that was so that people could hear that he was moving around and that he was still alive. And you'll read, again, rabbinic sort of speculations about tying a rope around his leg because, again, someone figured out, well, if God kills him, if he does something wrong, if he's impure and God strikes him down, how do we get him out? And so you, you tie a rope around the leg. And if the bells stop you know, ringing, then there might be a problem. Okay, There might be trouble, that sort of thing. Again, that never actually, there's no, there's no actual instance of that, either in the Old Testament or, again, other ancient sources. But you will read about uh, this, this kind of, of, of speculation, kind of, uh, you know, hey, maybe we should do this or... Or someone will allude to the fact that it was done, but nothing ever happened. Again, how do you validate that historically? Well, I, I guess you can't in one sense. But again, just in terms of a practical sort of solution to, you know, a problem that could come up in somebody's mind. Well, you know, because of Nadab and Abihu, like in, in Leviticus 10, what, what if this happens to the high priest? What, how do we get him out? We can't just go in there. And if he's, if he's in the Holy of Holies, even the priests... You know, no priest is going to say, yeah, I'll go in and get him because he could get struck dead too. So again, as a practical consideration, yeah, maybe this is why the bells were there. Maybe they did tie a rope around his ankle or something. Again, you, you, you'll you see that referenced. You'll see this problem alluded to, but you don't actually have an incident of it. But it's kind of interesting. The ephod itself I find interesting because it's made of wool. Again, if you go back to Exodus, the chapters that describe its its constitution, it's made of wool and linen, and it has gold threads woven into the fabric, and so much so that it has a golden appearance. Now, the reason I mention this, you know, the sort of the amount of gold, I'm, I'm hinting at something here, is that elsewhere in the Old Testament, you will see people like David call for the ephod to be brought to them. You'll see Gideon Okay, Gideon, quote, sets up an ephod in Judges 8, verse 7 in his hometown. He, he either makes a replica of this or, you know, it, ha it has something to do with, with divination, with asking God questions for the will of God and that sort of thing. Because in the high priest's ephod, you know, you had, you had uh, again, the Urim and the Thummim on, on this this in this pouch that th was on the breast piece. And that's what the high priest would use again to get knowledge from God. So there are other passages that either either that specific ephod was used again by a, a high priest or some priest to a ask questions of God, or you have somebody like Gideon who might have sort of made his own. And the question is, well, that's just kind of odd. Why are you asking for like a garment to be brought up? And how do you quote, set up a garment? 
Well, this has led to some speculation. Some people say, well, maybe they're just using the term ephod for a statue, like Gideon made a statue or an idol or something, because Gideon, by this time in Judges 8, really isn't a good guy. Maybe that's what's going on. Others suggest, well, maybe they made a statue and they and they clothed it. They put clothes on it so that it would look like the high priest. And then, then that was brought out, something like that. There's another possibility here. If there was enough gold in this thing, and if it was the actual ephod, or again, an, an exact replica, there is the possibility that, you, that it could have stood on its own. It, 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 could have, it could have supported its own weight because of the gold in it, and it would have sort of held the fabric firm, and you could, you could move it around and, and stand it erect. Who knows? I mean, it, we're, we're not specifically told. It's just that the same term, the ephod, is used in these, these contexts, uh, especially Gideon, the, the, you have the, uh, the, the other... There's the issue with the Levite in, later in the book of Judges, There's, whose name is Micah. Again, he's not really the high priest, but yet he has this ephod and he uses it. So you have these situations where they're using something and something is moved around. Something is brought to them and put back that has something to do with the way the actual ephod functioned. Now, the, again, the high priest would have been wearing this thing and again, would have had the orium and thumim inside of it. So there's some apparent attempt to either use that actual object or to make something like it to use for divination, to get knowledge you know, from God on the part of other people. So again, it's speculation. We're not specifically told, but you know, those are the possibilities. You know, while we're at it, let's, let's talk a little bit about the Orium and the Thumim. That's mentioned in verse 8. And this, this is really, I don't know, somebody should just make a you know, a Twilight Zone episode out of the Orium and the Thumim, because you, you, there's just all sorts of interesting possibilities here. So we have it in verse eight, you know, Moses places the breast piece on Aaron and in the breast piece, he puts the Orium and the Thumim. So what are these things? Again, there's two of them. There are these two objects. What are they? Now, the meanings of Orium and Thumim, even that's not completely clear. They're apparently stone objects. And the question is, there's a number of questions about them, but the first question is, what shape were they in? Were they flat or fairly flat stones, like on one side? And that question is raised because in Mesopotamia, there are similar objects used to cast lots. Now you say, well, what? why are we talking about casting lots with the Orium and the Thummim? Because in passages like 1 Samuel 14, uh, where the Orium and the Thummim are brought out, you know, this is the, the episode where Saul, you know, makes this stupid vow about nobody can eat anything until this battle's won. And of course, Jonathan, his son, doesn't hear it. And Saul's like, anybody who eats anything is going to be put to death. And so Jonathan's the hero of the battle, but he has some honey out in the battlefield because he was exhausted and he comes back and then this is found out. And so Saul is put in the awkward position of having to execute the guy responsible for winning the battle. And of course, they don't do that. The people basically protect Jonathan and protest that the whole thing of just basically this was a dumb thing to say. But while Saul is trying to figure out what's going on here, who's the guilty party because he hears about this, they bring out the Urim and the Thummim, and it's actually said that that they are cast, they are thrown down uh, in in the Hebrew text. And so the speculation is that, well, maybe they were flat on one side, and, and so they would land either one side or the other. Because again, you have this casting lot terminology associated with the Orium and the Thummim. Now, if that's the case, if you only if if the Orium and the Thummim were like flat, flat stones where they could be on one side or the other, in other words, they couldn't stand on edge if you threw them, then the view is that, well, there must have been something on them that that elicited either a yes or a no response, a positive or a negative response. And so some scholars believe that the Orium and the Thummim were designed specifically for yes and no questions of God. Now, if that's the case, <laughs> again, if that's the case, the word thumim in Hebrew, tumim, has a fairly apparent meaning because it would be from the Hebrew uh, adjective tom, which means to be complete or to be innocent. Orim, therefore, if if we have this polar oppositional idea, orim 
which is Aleph, Resh, and then the M at the end is the plural, could come from the Hebrew lemma Arar, Aleph, Resh, Resh, which means to curse. So you could have on the face of one side of the stone, the word for curse, and on the other side of the stone, the word for innocent which would sort of by extension be yes and no, or you'd have, you'd have to be careful about, you know, what question you were asking and then you threw them. And so the idea was whichever side comes up, that's what God is telling us, cursed or innocent, yes or no. So you'd have to think about the way you wanted to ask the question. Now, again, this is just a theory. And it, it obviously, if, if, you're, if you're tracking with me, it raises the question, well, what happened if, if you throw the two things down and then opposite sides both show up? You have the yes and the no both show. Then what do you do? Uh, again, the, the, there's, a, there's actually an instance in the Septuagint that gives us a little, a little glimpse into this, that there might be something to this theory. So I'm going to read from, it's either Milgram or Levine, I, I can't remember which uh, at this point, but he, one of them says, there's a classic instance of the use of the Urim and Thummim preserved in 1 Samuel 14, again, which I've already alluded to. King Saul's orders had been disobeyed in order to discover the guilty parties. He has recourse to the oracular inquiry of God. So hoping that his son, Jonathan, will not be identified. <laughs> I mean, when it gets sort of down where Jonathan's a possibility that the Septuagint version of this story uh, has Saul saying to the Lord, show the Thummim. In other words, show the, show the Tom side, show the innocent side. And that, because that's going to clear Jonathan. So in the Septuagint, you get this statement by Saul. He says, Saul then said to the Lord, the God of Israel, why have you not responded to your servant today? If this inquiry is due to my son, Jonathan, or or to me, O Lord God of Israel, show Urim. You know, if, if one of us is guilty, show the cursed side. And if you say it was due to your people, Israel, show the Tamim. Then we're both cleared. And then, of course, you know, it, it turns up, you know, to be Jonathan. Well, look at what Saul says. Why have you not responded to your servant? Now, this is in the Septuagint. You're not going to get it in the Masoretic text. So the speculation here is because Saul asks for the, the, the Tumim side. So some scholars will say, look, here's an indication that on one side was innocent, other side was cursed. Yes, no kind of questions. And it, since Saul has to say, why haven't you answered? The speculation is that he had thrown them a number of times and you got one of each show up and Saul's getting a little frustrated. You know, so he's like, oh, come on, you know, give us an answer here. And then, of course, it turns out to be something against him. Again, that, that's how the Septuagint has it. It's, the Septuagint actually adds information that you don't get in the traditional Masoretic text. But it, it sort of goes hand in hand with this idea that the Urim and the Thummim were, were stones that were, were flat so that you, you, you would get one or the other when you threw them out, when you cast them. Kind of like flipping a coin, you know, heads or tails, that sort of thing. So... Again, maybe that's the case. Maybe it isn't. You know, who knows? There, there are some problems with it, even though it's, it sort of works or it sort of could work. Uh, Milgram points out that there, there are some issues here. There are some problems. So he says, even if the Septuagint represents the correct story and the correct uh, you know, text, the theory would not allow for an inconclusive answer. You'd have to keep throwing the things, which just kind of, you know, to Milgram just doesn't feel right. He says it also wouldn't explain the plural forms of Urim and Thummim. Why not just have Ur or Arar, curse, and Tom, you know, for innocent? Why, why the plural? Why the plural word? That doesn't make any sense if it's just a yes or no possibility. And Milgram adds, above all, it would not explain how the oracle was able to give more than yes and no answers. Because that does happen. Okay, in Judges uh, 1... 1 and 2, we uh, have well, Judges 1, Judges 18, 1 Samuel 10, right around verse 22, 2 Samuel 2, the beginning of the chapter, and then 2 Samuel 5, you have incidents that involve David, Saul, David a couple times actually, and then of course the, the, the people of Israel in the beginning of Judges, Judges 18 would be the other Levite. Again, you have them inquiring of God, quote unquote. Now some of these in fact, I think maybe all of them don't actually say that the Urim and the Thummim were, were brought out and when the question was asked, but the same formulaic language to inquire of God, Sha'al, to ask of God, that is used with the Urim and the Thummim episodes shows up in these instances. And the answers to the questions 
are just beyond yes and no possibilities. You actually get sort of full answers. Uh, for instance, at the one in Second Samuel 5, David inquired of the Lord. This is Second Samuel 5, 23, 24. And the Lord answered, do not go up, but circle behind them and confront them at the Baca trees. And when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the Baca trees, then go into action for the Lord will be going in front of you to attack the Philistine forces. That is way beyond. Yes, go up. No, don't go up. So how in the world were the Urim and the Thummim, if they're only, you know, if, if it's a stone with, with two flat sides and one's yes, one's no, one's curse, one's innocent, how in the world do you get a fully developed answer like that? And again, these other passages are, have similar things in them that are just more, more fully developed answers. How do you get that with just a yes or no possibility with a two-sided Urim and the Thummim? So again, Milgram's not the only one to, to point this out, that, that you've, you've got kind of a problem here. How do you, it just doesn't work with, in these instances. Again, under the assumption that to inquire of the Lord means to go get the priest, bring the ephod, get out the Urim and the Thummim and cast those babies down. And then, you know, we'll, we'll find out what God wants us to do. So that, that's the assumption. Now, this has led to a second possibility or at least a second theory. Some scholars have argued, I'm going to throw in a third too, because it's one I heard in Bible college that always makes me chuckle, but I'm, I'm just, that, that's a freebie. The, the, the second serious one is that some scholars argue that the Urim and the Thummim were not flat, that they were actually sort of square shaped like dice. Okay. They, they had you know, more than two sides. They had multiple sides. And that on the, those sides were the letters, the 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Now, or I should say maybe not all 22, but maybe most of them are, are something like that. Here's the logic. Since Hebrew is a Semitic language and most words, most lemmas, the lemma is the basic dictionary def, dictionary spelling of a word. Like if, if you wanted to look up the word running in an English dictionary, you won't find running. You'll find run though. You'll find the base form of the word. In Hebrew, the base form of words are typically overwhelmingly spelled with only three consonants. It's a tri-radical language, a tri-literal language. And so most of the words in the language are going to only have three letters. And so you could fit enough of the alphabet <laughs> on a multi-sided object, okay, to account for a lot of the vocabulary in Hebrew. And that that's the theory. You might think, well, that that's, it just sounds kind of weird. Well, wait, wait till you hear number three. <laughs> if, let, let's just say, let, let's just use dice. Dice we use now as an illustration have six sides. So let's say you had two of these. You have 12 sides and you put 12 letters of the Hebrew alphabet on. I mean, you're missing 10. But let's just say you put 12, maybe like the beginning consonant for each tribe or something like that. And now you got two dice and you, whatever two sides, when you throw the things, they, they land face up, you know, okay, you, you take those two and then maybe you throw another one and then you get your third consonant. And now you, now you've got your first word or you keep throwing them and you just write out the consonants. And then it's the priest's job to take all those letters and figure out what God's trying to say, you know, which ones sort of make words. Again, it, it's kind of an odd theory, but this is a theory that's actually talked about in the literature. If you can't, if the priest couldn't make sense of it, then that would be interpreted as God's silence. Okay. So again, on the surface, it sounds like it has a little bit of logic to it because a lot of people just don't prefer the two-sided option because you get answers that are really kind of long, kind of complicated. Again, who knows? Now, if you think that's bizarre, here's the third theory I'll throw in. I, I heard this in Bible college, and again, it always makes me chuckle. The third suggestion is that the Urim and the Thummim weren't used in those instances that give longer answers. What was used was the breast piece, because that's also part of the ephod. And on the breast piece, you'll recall, you had these 12 stones, and on the stones were written the names of the tribes of Israel. And so the theory here is that when you ask God a question, that involved more than a yes or no answer, that the stones, <laughs> yeah, I can't help it. I'm, ju I'm chuckling here. We, we used to call this the blinking light theory in, in Bible college. The stones would light up and then the priest would write down the consonants on that stone. And again, whatever stones lit up, those are the ones you'd write down and then you have to figure out what the message is. Okay. Do you, you like that? If you like that better than the other two, congratulations. Again, nobody really knows precisely what the Urim and the Thummim were and how this worked. The only real indication you get is 1 Samuel 14 when they are cast. 
Okay, so there, there must have been some sort of casting thing, casting act going on. There you have it. Okay, so every time someone inquires of the Lord, do we assume it's Urim and the Thummim when they're not actually mentioned? Some say yes, some say no. Those who say no say maybe it was the breast pieces or the, the you know the ephod you know it's itself or who knows what's going on. I mean that's the honest answer. You can come up with ideas as to how this might have worked, and for yes and no questions, it, it works kind of well. But for the ones that go beyond yes and no. Who knows? Again, I've, I've just given you the speculation. So if you find any of those entertaining, you know, good. Because like I said, a year, years after I heard that the blinking light theory, I still love it. Just, just makes me chuckle every time.